Då skulle jag vilja börja som marknadschef och fråga marknadschefen på lantmännen. Då. Alltså, eller förlåt, grangården. Förlåt, förlåt, förlåt. Eh, det här är ju egentligen, om jag nu då lite dumt tänker mig så känns det ungefär som det här är att jobba med redan befintliga kunder. Hur paketerar du det då i din totala mix av att vinna kunder också utifrån varumärket? Hur ser det ut liksom procentuellt i fördelning i pengar och alltså i, arbetskra- i tid? Mm, eh, I pengar, förutom att jag inte säger siffrorna, så är det fortfarande så att 70 procent lägger jag på att kampanja. Eh, 30 procent lägger jag på, på det här. Eh, men det som jag ser som en fördel i kampanjerna det är att eh, vi behöver inte skriva så himla mycket texter i våra kampanjer. Vi plockar rätt mycket från den här delen. Och Johan då som är redaktör för Grandliv och för vår blogg och som då sitter och skiffer. Förutom att han kan otroligt mycket om vårt, vårt företag och vårt produktområde. Så, så kan vi, genom det så kan vi använda honom i alla kanalerna. Så att vi har honom i utbudet och vi har honom i varumärkesbyggandet. Okej. Okay. Okej, okay. I will också säga Joey. If it's okay, we will hold most of the questions in, in Swedish. But if you have a That's question okay. for Joe... I'll just take a nap see. while those are going on. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a, one opening question, though. I, I, I'm, I guess. When okay, somebody sorry. speaks English, I'll perk up. I have a question to Granngården. We have 900 000 members in our club club. On which way and how have you managed to recruit all of them? Genom att från början så gjorde vi det här till butikernas kundklubb. De var med från början när vi gjorde testen och de var med på upplägget varför vi skulle ha en kundklubb. Och vi var ute jättemycket med dem i början och, och förklarade fördelarna med att de skulle ha kundklubben till sig eller sina medlemmar till sig. Och vi har aldrig haft den här jättestora budgeten i marknadsföringspengar men genom att de själva fick fick en ägande roll av sina kundklubbsmedlemmar och de också försöker påverka dem att lämna ifrån sig sina e-postadresser så har de hela tiden sett effekten och nyttan av att de äger dem själva. Och vi säger ju att vi på centralt håll supporterar det här och, och sköter administrationen av den. Det, det är en av fortfarande den stora vinsten att butikerna äger dem tycker jag. Medlemmarna rekryteras i butikerna? Ja, 99 procent av dem kommer från butiken. Och då har vi också till trots haft en, vi har inte världens moderna system för vår klubb. Utan har en, ett gammalt lik höll jag på att säga, men det är det inte. Men det är ett väldigt gammalt system. Så ända fram till för ett år sedan så behövde man som kundklubbsmedlem eller som kund fylla i namn och adress och personnummer och gärna intressen och hur man bodde. Så det tog ju tre minuter att göra den här ifyllningen. Sen för ett år sedan så lyckades vi i alla fall få pengar loss. Vi kunde lägga till en liten applikation. Så nu kör vi det som de flesta kör med personnummer och skannar ett körkort. Men det vi också gjorde från början var att vi bad alla kunderna registrera sig hur de bodde och vilka fritidsintressen de hade. Men det insåg vi efter två år att det var rätt irrelevant för oss. För hunden kan ha dött. Och flickorna som i mitt fall kan ha slutat att rida. Då vill jag inte ha häst erbjudanden. Så nu går vi på det som de flesta gör. Vi går på ett köpbeteende istället. Så har man köpt hästprodukter så får man hästerbjudande. Där har vi en fråga. Hi, uh, my name is Karen. I work as copywriter and project manager at uh, web agency Accelera here in Gothenburg. I have a question for Joe. Uh, during the workshop that Thomas and Max had with Patrick, um, you talked a whole lot about speaking the same language and using the same terms as your uh, a customer does. Uh, you can't use the term wash basin if your customer uses the term sink. So I was just wondering from a content marketing point of view, what is your opinion about SEO in general? I think that you shouldn't create content specifically, you shouldn't have your content plan specific to say, oh, it's, it's, SEO is the end all be all. Uh, but the way, and I'll tell you the way that we do it, um, and it's been working quite well for us and a lot of our customers. So we have an editorial plan. We set the editorial plan up. We know that, well, here's the, strat- here's the audience, here's the strategy, here's the 
blog post that we're going to put through, and here is the general keyword that we're targeting with it. That keyword rolls up into 50, a rolling list of 50 different keyword phrases. Though that changes on a month-to-month -month basis depending on what our goals are and how those change. We know at any one particular time where we rank against our competition for every one of those keyword phrases, and then I also know what our number one ranked post is for that phrase and whether or not we're competing against ourselves. This is something we started implementing about three years ago. It's completely transformed how we get found in search. So we have the, we have the raw content that's created uh, that could come from a contributor, it could come from staff, and then that goes to the managing editor. The managing editor then edits that content specifically for human beings, and then that goes to the person that looks at it for SEO, looks at it specifically for the content and specifically, really specifically for the title. And then also looks at it, hey, are we competing against ourselves? What should we look at? That's been probably the best process when we brought in a separate person. They work about five hours, 10 hours a week, and that's all they do specifically for SEO. So I never want to, I want the editors to really drive the strategy, our content directors to drive that strategy, but at the end of the day, we want to get found for, by human beings in search engines. That's a, main, a good driver of our traffic, so we've got to make sure we're cognizant of how they search for those terms. So if that changes or whatnot, this, like this industry, for example, it's been called a lot of things, custom publishing, branded content, branded storytelling, uh, custom content. It goes, there's like 20 different terms. And if we're targeting a particular country, let's say, for example, the Netherlands, the Netherlands were always big for customer media. Customer media was the term for this industry. So if we wanted to target uh, content marketers in the Netherlands, we better be using, or we should have used, customer media to do that. No, by the way, one of our posts was changed to customer media specifically for that. So I, I'm, we're always keeping it in mind, but it, it's always a part of the process, but it doesn't overtake us as this is why we do content creation. If that's, so it's, it's relevance first, really, and, and terms. Does it make, yeah, yeah, does it make sense to the content, makes yeah. sense to the audience? I mean, if it's, it's all about, fun, SEO is all about findability. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to make sure I'm creating the right content, but at the end of the day, I have to make sure it's found. That means SEO, that means I have to look at paid content opportunities, that's where native advertising comes in. So, but SEO right now is a big portion of that. My concern is if I just looked at SEO, I mean, that's still, again, own, I mean, for the most part, Google owns that ship. And if I put all my eggs in that basket and they decide tomorrow to change their algorithm, like many companies out there have done, and they say, oh, this is how we're gonna game the system today. Tomorrow, it's destroyed the company. I wanna look at it like a stock portfolio and diversify my distribution strategies where I'm saying, okay, this is search, this is paid, this is organic and social, shareability and whatnot, and that's a better strategy for, I think, most companies. So what is your, your um, most commonly given advice to the companies that have an internal um, word or term for a product and where you know that the customers have another term for it? Is, is your advice to stop using the internal term altogether or to combine the two? Or No, I, I would probably say in that a particular situation, you'd have pages of content targeting both. Different pages with different pieces of content on it. So if I want to target branded content and content marketing, I have a content marketing post and I have a branded content post. It may have similar themes to it, but it's a different piece of content. I'm not just saying, oh, let's combine it into two. You have to, if, in order to get found in search, you want to be as focused as you possibly can on a particular subject. So if you mix that up, I think it's the wrong decision, but I think you need a probably separate pieces of content for that. Thank you. You got it. Good question. Okay. Oh, here we go. I have a question for Joe. Uh, what, what is the key differences between PR and content marketing? Well, first of all, I have to say that I'm not a PR expert. I've never been in PR, although I do claim that some PR folks are my friends. So other than that, I've got to lay that out first. Um, there's a lot of different parts of public relations. The way that I look at it in my simplistic form is that I'm going to, to have relationships with other properties out there to get coverage in other channels. Can content marketing be part of that? Can I be telling stories that fits into somebody else that wants to tell a story about me? Great. But 
to my knowledge in working with the PR folks that we work with, they're never really as focused on owned media channels that we own, that we have control over. They're trying to get placement in other media outlets, bloggers, and whatever. So that's how I see it as a difference. Now, they're great storytellers on the PR side, but where I think that where we say, okay, who owns it? Does marketing own it? Does PR own it? It could be either one, depending on the organization. I want those two to work together, but in, in most cases, PR is gonna work with me on my influencer strategy, getting coverage where it makes sense. In a lot of cases, though, that content can be used on both sides of the house, but at the end of the day, content marketing, I'm owning those channels, and PR, I'm probably getting it placed. And if there's PR experts that wanna disagree with me, I'm completely fine, but that's how I, that's how I look at it. Uh, I'm, I might uh, do that. Hi, uh, I've been in both advertising and uh, PR, uh, and uh, PR is not about getting media coverage. Uh, PR is about building reputation and trust uh, with an audience, and that can be done in many ways. But I do think that a lot of PR folks still think that that's exactly the, the, the way. My question actually was uh, organizational dynamics. Um, you've been advising clients for a lot of years now on content marketing and the changes in, in, in that. Related to the PR and marketing folks, when, when you talk about this new era of, of content marketing, um, what sort of organizational change do you see happening with your clients when they take on these uh, things, whether it be related to PR marketing or just getting other content creators involved? Well, if we're going to have that conversation, there's got to be drinks involved. Because <laughs> that's a heavy-duty conversation, Jonathan. Um, the first thing that I would say is there are content creators in every one of these. I don't care how big you are as a company. What we find is there's, you have content creators in social, email, in public relations, in IT, in, in human resources, and in a lot of cases, in even mid-sized companies, a lot of these people don't even talk to each other or know each other. So the first thing that we want to do, and it's worked well in a, in a lot of the tech companies we work with, is uh, somebody who's championing that needs to bring those people together. They need to meet, they need to figure out what their goals are, they have individual goals that they're trying to meet, and then how can we all understand those goals and help each other? Whether you call it a consortium, whether you get together on a weekly meeting, whatever, it doesn't matter. That then starts for what I think content marketing can look like in the organization. If content marketing just becomes a department, I think that you're probably long-term you're gonna have a problem because content is, it flows throughout the business. It's not just about this thing called, well, we're doing a blog or a custom magazine. What I wanna do is what I think Kraft Foods has done and Coca-Cola has done and Red Bull has done where it is a, um, it's a horizontal that works within and among all the other silos. So we have to have somebody that's champion that from the organizational standpoint, like for Coca-Cola, although Jonathan Mildenhall just went to Airbnb, but he was leading that content marketing strategy for Coca-Cola. And then his responsibility was work, to work with the product team, to work with the social team, to, but it was coming from them. And then they worked with agencies and freelancers and whatnot. So I think you have to have somebody that's in charge and championing the story. And I think that we're calling it content creation management. We haven't come up with a better term for that, but that seems to be the way. And we just, we haven't released it yet, but we're, come, we're releasing some research soon. And that seems to be what these large enterprise marketers are trying to do so it just doesn't get stuck into another silo. Does that help? Okay, you owe me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is it content marketing or event marketing? Uh, it's a lot more than that. It's, you, could, you could make the case that it's, a con it's content marketing, it's event marketing, it's traditional publishing, it's media, uh, however you want to call it. The, the first thing that I'll say uh, with the Michelin Guide, and for those of you that don't know the Michelin Guide, they, they created a guide for travelers 
Michelin is a tire company. So it was the resource, and uh, I think it was back in 1904, early, early 1900s when they started that publication. And it was in print, and of course it has still made its way over. I don't see it as important, as important anymore because competition has replaced a lot of that. They haven't focused on it and updated it as much as I think they could have. I think they had a big head start, and um, I think it became a project. I, didn't, I don't think it became integral to the organization, and this is, this is how we're going to help our customers and help them get around and help them travel. Now you've got TripAdvisor and you've got lots of other places online that do that. They had a lead, and I think they just kept it, oh, this is our project, instead of saying, well, what other needs do these travelers have? How can we be more important in their lives? And so I think it, now it's a, just a nice project. We talk about it because it's older. Um, so I would have liked to see him done more with that. And then with, with Red Bull, the, when I'm thinking about content marketing with Red Bull Media House, and they're the ones that would say that we are a media company that just happens to sell energy drinks. That has come straight from Red Bull people inside Red Bull Media House, and that's the way they look at it. Look at, yeah, look at the Space, uh, the space Jump guy. That's, that was an event. They created a plethora of content initiatives around that. So they created the scenario, but there was a plan for the 300 plus videos that they have on YouTube with different interviews and whatnot and different parts of that event and how they told that story ongoing. What I love about Red Bull is actually Red Bull Bulletin, which they have over six, I think it's over six million subscribers now to the Bulletin. That's what you really call an owned strategy and bringing more people in. But I think that it's more of it's the approach. If you, uh, I mean, do you ever, have you ever read anything from Red Bull or seen anything or looked at a video or says, ah, Red Bull, it tastes so good. Does it doesn't really taste good. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but they never talk about the product. They talk about the lifestyle. They talk about the experience. And that just happens to play in all of the media that they create. So um, the other thing just to note about Red Bull, they have a content group where they license and syndicate their content to publishers, so their publishers and media companies are paying Red Bull to license that content. So it is a profitable portion of Red Bull. So that's in one case where you actually see there's a media business model within a product company. Does that answer any of your questions? Okay, great, great examples. Um, I would like to make a comment on Paris' question here, actually. <laughs> Um, because you are separating event marketing from content marketing, and I don't think you have to do that. Uh, at Content, we see our breakfast events every month as part of our content marketing strategy. The blog is for demand generation and creating a demand for our breakfast events. And when you are participating there, you have to make a registration, and if you have been there for like two or three times, we know that you are interested and we have a lead. So event is a lead generation mm -hmm. in the content marketing strategy. Like well, yes, my you know, it's a great, it's a great point. And um, if you look at the greatest media companies of all time, they have three legs. They have this, this digital leg. Look at uh, New York Times or look at uh, ESPN. They have a digital leg. They have a print leg. And they have an event leg. So if you're trying to emulate, well, what do the greatest publishers of all time do? They use every one of those platforms. And they work off each other and integrate that. So I mean, that's a great point. Yeah. What shall we do within medium, medium sized companies struggling with small budgets, nobody knows us, or the startup company? Mm -hmm. Because every example I would take is usually Pepsi, Coke, they fucking everywhere. In That's why we have Gangor on you. That I understood. <laughs> you understand. I mean, <laughs> when you're a small yep. company or a small medium sized company, you're struggling for survival. Mm -hmm. And I mean, why should I start with this one now? I, I actually think that it's easier for us here to do a content marketing strategy than the bigger companies because we can move faster than they can. Because they have all kinds of policy. And I'll tell you, I don't want to go too long on this, but a quick story. We work with one of the t top 10 largest companies in the world. We got together for a meeting on content marketing strategy. About 40 people were getting in the room. Set the, the lead seven marketers for each of their product categories that they they get into that are responsible for content marketing. 
they get into a room together, they'd never met before. They'd never met each other before. And we, I think we talked about this last night. And then we met, talked to the national sales rep for that organization. And, and they're talking about, oh, we're creating all this great content for you, Mr. Sales Guy, so that you can then spread out all this wonderful content to your customers. You know what? Never used any of that content they created. He had his own agency on the side. <laughs> they're a mess. And this is the rule and not the exception. Here's what we can do if you don't have a, a, a huge budget. You just have to focus on that audience and that niche where you can really be the leading provider of that information in the world. It's, it's yours right now for the taking if you focus on it and do it consistently over time, as long as you're patient and you want to do it. That's where I think the smaller companies are at an advantage. You don't need to have the big budget. Actually, a lot of these examples we're talking about are what I would call big content projects. Still very, very campaign related. Red Bull's a little bit different, but in a lot of the cases, the Coca-Cola stuff, just very, they're good stories, but they're still within a campaign. I think if we can, we can focus, think and act like publishers, there's an opportunity. Okay, Yeah, Thomas? let's think of, Lena, you mentioned yes before, how much money you are putting into traditional marketing. It was like 90%, what did you say? In traditional? Yes. Uh, in both media, we, we put about uh, 70%. And if I don't recall wrong, has said in an interview he made for a while that it's like 64% of all your clients is coming through the, the, through the customer yeah. loyalty program, yes. So that so meaning that it is much cheaper to do content marketing actually than traditional marketing. <laughs> so that maybe is, is an answer as well. Depends on you want to win the customer, you want to gain more out of the, the customer that you have. Sorry, can you repeat? Oh, it depends if you want to win new customers or you want to gain more out of the customers that you have. That's the question you work with as a marketing manager all the time. You have to win, you have to get more customers, and you have to get more out of the customers that you have. Yes. So, but, but I mean, as you're talking about uh, in our workshop, it depends on where in, in the um, process you want to catch them. It's in the beginning you, you want to create customers, then you have to work with demand generation and lead generation. If you want to keep them and make them uh, buying more stuff later on and be loyal and recommend your stuff, then you have to work in the end of the sales cycle instead. And in your case, I guess it's both actually. It's a loyalty program, but you have increased it tremendously from, uh, I think the figure you had mentioned before, AQT was entering was like 100,000, mm -hmm. and now you are almost 900,000. So it's a ninefold increase in five, six years only. Yep. So you have both in that case. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, uh, the figure you, you, you talked about was pretty scary. It's, uh, well, to start with, nine of, out of ten says they do content marketing, but uh, they really don't. That's interesting. You, you Thomas, you wrote a uh, provocative uh, blog about that, right? Yeah, I wrote a blog post called You Think You're Making Content Marketing, yeah. But You Don't and which based on the figures that you have shown from US and UK and Australia and which we have also seen in Sweden, that nine of 10 marketers say they're doing content marketing and yet you have figures showing that only 40% of them have a strategy for it. Why is it so hard to do a strategy? Why must it be so complicated? Just four out of 10 do. The, this, we are, most of us have been built and if we're at all trained in <laughs> traditional marketing. This mm. is just a different muscle. It's like when you first, like we were talking about running a half marathon. Mm. Um, when I first started running and I said, my goal is to finish a half marathon, I couldn't even complete a half mile. I wasn't used to using those miles. I wasn't, I wasn't trained for it. I wasn't in condition. This is something that we've got to try over and over and over. We're not even used to, hey, well, how do we start a documented yeah. kind? What does it mean to do this stuff? Most of, if you come from a publishing background, it's actually quite easy to do this because you've lived it, you understand it. Mm. Um, if you're from a marketing or a public relations background or something different, it's just a different entity. We're not used to looking at, con looking at marketing as an asset. And mm. that's what this is. It's just it's yeah. a different way to look at it. And isn't it, I mean, now we're all inspired and want to go back to the office and start doing content marketing. Isn't that important to start with uh, like small steps? Think small from the beginning. Well, so I think it's, you start on which audience do you want to start with? Yeah. We all have, you all right now have multiple audiences and you have to decide. Most of, most of the time, most companies will go out and say, oh, we're going to do a blog now. Mm. We're going to do a newsletter. And it basically targets all customers. 
well, that's probably not going to work. It's just like we were talking yesterday um, that big software company has 18 different audiences, mm. one blog. And I asked her, she said, what should I do? And I said, well, how's it working for you? I said, not very good. We're getting a little bit of stuff from everywhere. We can't really measure it. It's because you're tar- you have 18 audiences and you're, try- you're, you're basically doing one blog for those 18. So I'd say start small. Focus on the audience. That could be the low-hanging fruit where you think it's the best opportunity. It could be current customers that you say, hey, I want to get a little bit more business out of these people. Let's focus on them. I would start really small. Do a six-month test. We call it a pilot program. Start there. Uh, get the hypothesis for what we think it's going to do for the business. Get mm-hmm. the le- business leaders in the room and saying, this is what we're trying. This is why we're doing it. Here's the metrics we think we're going to follow. We're going to be back in six months, and we're going to see how we do. Iterate the program mm-hmm. and, and go from there as long as you know that it's probably not going to, it's probably going to take longer than six months, depending on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. That was also something uh, you were talking about, uh, Max. Like, you have to do your homework first before you can measure it. Uh, yeah, of course. And, and I think the, the, the fun part is to write stuff and, add, and upload photos and stuff. And the boring part is maybe to have a plan and have to measure things and work with mm-hmm. software as Google Analytics. So it's a lot easier to start in the creative process. But I think you can earn a lot by having some kind of measurements or uh, some kind of plan or schedule for what you're going to do. Um, so, so that's why I think uh, that's the case right now. That's the key, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. I think as Patrick said, uh, the comparison, if you are a smaller company, I think the alternative, you have to look to the alternatives as well, and the alternative to buy media or buy um, reach uh, about your brand or product, uh, then your budget won't last very long as well. So I think it's a smarter way to start by creating your own content. It would be more cost efficient and Maybe you can try it for a bit with uh, internal resources, resources instead of uh, buying ads. So I, I think it, it, uh, it's a good solution for smaller companies as well, actually. Mm. Joe, you're using two words that's very important. You're using customer and audience. What's the difference between those two for you? Because sometimes your audience you're targeting is not your customer. So, for example, if I'm going to do an influencer program, not my customer, but, they, but my customers listen to those influencers. So that's completely different. Let's say that it's not the ultimate buyer that you're targeting, but you're targeting uh, a gatekeeper of some kind, uh, somebody that's an influencer in the buying decision, but not generally the audience, the, the actual customer. Uh, so for B2B, right, you might have seven or eight different people in that process. So I would really go back and say, well, who of that seven or eight people am I targeting? I'm not targeting all eight. I'm targeting one or maybe two at most of those eight. So that's where the difference comes in. Good question. Okay. I think that had to be our closing question, actually. Uh, so I want to thank, thank you all for being here yeah. today. Very good. Thank you. And uh, if you have more questions, I'm sure you can find those people out here. I had a couple of more fun things to say. But you said that it's content marketing is really taking off uh, in Sweden. There that you was go. interesting to hear. And you also said that there are a lot of followers, Swedes, that are following. Well, I want to come back in like so. six months and everybody's got <laughs> yeah. plans. That was right. We can talk about more about that outside. <laughs> you got it. Uh, Lena has to rush to taxi. So thank you all. And uh, I will thank you all for being here today.